Welcome to The Theology of the Buddy, a podcast for Catholics who love the beauty of the Church's sacred tradition. This is episode 70. My name is Chris, and I'm joined by my wonderful co-host and fellow son of thunder, a Cosmos to my Damien, a Basil to my Gregory, Michael Strauss. If you are somebody who's looking to grow in their faith in new ways, connect with other faithful Catholics who love the Lord, or looking for other Catholic voices who are willing to speak the truth without compromise, but have a little fun along the way, you've come to the right place. We're not experts, but have learned a lot collectively over the 15 plus years that we've been friends in the faith. And we want to share that with you. So if you haven't yet subscribed, make sure you hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to ensure you get the best Catholic candid conversations delivered to you every week. While you're at it, don't forget to follow us on social media so you can keep up to date with all of the great content we are sending out. Just search at Theology of the Buddy, one word, and you'll find us. All of our past episodes and show notes can be found at TheologyofTheBuddy.com. So, Advent traditionally has been a time to meditate on our final end and the four last things. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. We've now entered into the liturgical season of Advent, and so in that spirit, today we're talking about death, in particular, the death penalty. Today, the Sons of Thunder are returning to the podcast to thoughtfully respond to the confusion regarding the death penalty. This podcast is not intended for young listeners, so listener discretion is advised. A recent post from Catholic youth minister and personal friend of mine, Adam Eichelberger, on his public Instagram, ripped into Catholics who believe in the morality of the death penalty. He accused Catholics of being hypocrites and for causing grave scandal for their lack of true pro-life, whole-life ethics. Shortly thereafter, our good friend of ours, Billy from OK Catholics, a fantastic dungeon master and uh, D&D player, uh, but <laughs> a little confused on this point, uh, joined in the voices demanding for the abolition of the death penalty and accusing Catholics again of hypocrisy regarding their views on capital punishment. So we're going to take a look into some of their claims and respond to them as we do. Um, but before we do that, I just got to say, hey, Mike, happy first Sunday of Advent. How you doing, man? Doing great. It's uh, good to be here in the season of Advent. It is. I- I've been looking forward to it. Mm, this great penitential season. So, it so is. good. Shout out to Billy before we uh, <laughs> argue against him. Let's give him props for being correct about Advent being a penitential season. Yeah, it's probably probably his most traditional uh, <laughs> viewpoint. <laughs> yeah. One of the videos where he goes most into like trad sources back to old popes and stuff yeah. digs yeah. out all their uh, stuff about penitential advent i love it yeah it's so good i just i wish he would have done that with the death penalty but hey what can you do so um At this point billy you are the father mike schmitz and we are the billy <laughs> my my how the turntables <laughs> so um yeah Let's uh let let's let's get into this, man. So, um, can I, can I start with Billy's meme? Because yeah, I just want to be. I just want to start off with a meme because it's a fun spot. Billy put this good Pepperidge Farm meme where he says, "Remember when Catholics were consistent in their pro life ethics?" Okay, Catholics remembers well. <laughs> Personally, I don't remember because I was born during the pontificate of Pope John Paul II. Word. And the time when Catholics were united in a consistent pro-life ethic was when the hierarchy was consistently anti-abortion and consistently pro-death penalty. And that happened for a brief period between the years 33 and 1992. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So maybe we can, maybe we can start and kind of get into this whole situation. Right. So, so Adam, Adam Michael Berger, again, I love Adam. Adam is a, Adam's a good dude, good, 
good father and uh, he's a good good father two years um but uh he <laughs> <laughs> i mean he likes a lot of the same bands we do uh you would definitely see him repping sleeping giant and things like that but yeah and i'm gonna link to his um his instagram response in the show notes again you can find that at theology of the buddy.com it'll be the most recent episode, or you can find it under episode 70. Yeah. So his Instagram response was spurred on by the recent execution of Orlando Hall. For context, Orlando Hall was accused of some pretty gross, heinous crimes, um, including the kidnapping, raping multiple times and murdering of a 16 year old woman. Uh, he, buried her alive after brutally being beating her with a shovel multiple times and dousing her with gasoline. So Orlando Hall was executed on November 19th, 2020. He was the eighth federal execution in 2020 in the United States. Uh, U.S. Attorney General William Barr, a Catholic who actually recently won the Krista Vidala Slechi Award, uh, worked to overturn an injunction filed by Hall, um, which went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in a 6-3 decision, they decided to move forward with the execution. Amy Coney Barrett, another Catholic on the Supreme Court, voted in favor of staying the injunction. And this is kind of where Adams problem with this whole thing started. So Adam's claim essentially goes something like this. And and Mike, tell me if this is correct. So he, his claim would be that a consistent whole life ethic supports the right to life for all humans from conception to natural death. Every life has an inalienable dignity and worth. As such, the use of the death penalty does not honor the dignity of the human person or their right to life, and therefore should never be used. The church has spoken clearly about how the death penalty needs to be set aside. This Again, keep in mind, this is Adam's claim, that the church has spoken clearly about how the death penalty needs to be set aside. Any Catholic who supports the use of the death penalty is not truly pro-life and is a hypocrite. Um, would you say that that's... That would be correct, Mike. That's definitely what I heard from his his video. Okay, um, I think that's a pretty fair summation. Yeah. So, um, kind of the thrust of that that whole viewpoint is John Paul II. So, should I read? Should I read uh, the quote that he references, Mike? Sure. I just want to say one thing in intro about um, his video. Just kind of a first impression with what he was saying at first. Um, so you're talking about this whole life ethic. He, he talks about first how yes, abortion is more of an issue in terms of number of victims, but he's concerned about having a consistent ethic behind it, which is something that I think we can respect as like a point of agreement that it's not enough to, just oppose abortion out of convenience or because you happen to not like it. Our ethics have to be based in true Catholic teachings, right? That it's violence against the innocent and it's murder and God forbids it. These are good reasons, right? So we have to have the same kind of good reasons if we want to say that the death penalty is admissible. Right. Right. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I just want to get that in there before we uh, go into the whole JP2 yeah. quote. Yeah, and maybe an additional point that I, I kind of r regrettably didn't mention. So he would also say that because there are Catholics who hold that the use of the death penalty um, is morally licit, he would say that that is a grave – essentially, that is a grave scandal, though he doesn't use that kind of language. Um, he would say that is a grave scandal that is preventing us from properly evangelizing the nations and from bringing souls to Christ. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a pretty strong claim. He's saying essentially that – Essentially, that the belief in the death penalty is essentially Americanism in a way. Um and that is rooted in Americanism, and it's not actually a Catholic belief. 
but yeah, so, and this is kind of, he uses John Paul II as uh, kind of the thrust of this argument. So he makes reference to uh, Evangelium Vitae, which is an encyclical that was written in 1995 by John Paul II, uh, which he refers to John Paul as John Paul the Great, uh, which I, I used to do myself. Um, I, I can't do that anymore, but... Uh, so in paragraph 56, he states, quote, this is the context in which to place the problem of the death penalty. On this matter, there is a growing tendency, both in the church and in civil society, to demand that it be applied in a very limited way or even that it be abolished completely. The problem must be viewed in the context of a system of penal justice ever more in line with human dignity and thus, in the end, with God's plan for man and society. The primary purpose of the punishment which society inflicts is to, quote, to redress the disorder caused by the offense, end quote. Public authority must redress the violation of personal and social rights by imposing on the offender uh, an adequate punishment for the crime as a condition for the offender to regain the exercise of his or her freedom. In this way, authority also fulfills the purpose of defending public order and ensuring people's safety, while at the same time offering the offender an incentive and help to change his or her behavior and be re rehabilitated. It is clear for these Sorry, it is clear that for these purposes to be achieved, the nature and extent of the punishment must be carefully evaluated and decided upon, and ought not to go to the extreme of executing the offender except in cases of absolute necessity. In other words, when it would not be possible otherwise to defend society. Today, however, as a result of steady improvements in the organization of the penal system, such cases are very rare, if not practically non-existent. In any event, the principle set forth in the New Catechism of the Catholic Church remains valid. Quote, if bloodless means are sufficient to defend human lives against an aggressor and to protect public order and the safety of persons, public authority must limit itself to such means, because they better correspond to the concrete conditions of the common good and are more in conformity to the dignity of the human person. End quote. So, you know, based on that, Adam essentially is saying that we have in our modern day and age no reason to have recourse to the death penalty. And he echoes essentially what Pope Francis is – and has decided to put into the new catechism in uh, section 2267. This was something he decided to do in August, 2018, um, where he says specifically that uh, the church teaches in light, in the light of the gospel, that the death penalty is inadmissible because it is an attack on the inviolability and dignity of the person, and she works with determination for his abolition worldwide. So, I mean, again, these things are pretty big claims, but, I mean, do they fall in line with tradition? Do they fall in line with what the church has, has always taught? Mike, your thoughts? I'd say as far as... Hmm. John Paul II and the new catechism go. It's not like they're coming out and saying heretical things or anything, but some of these statements are very incomplete and kind of gloss over a lot of previous church teaching. And then they give very questionable applications of the teaching. So Maybe to step back, because some people are probably shocked that here we are Catholics saying catechism of the Catholic Church, not correct, because people probably think it's the catechism and it's infallible. It's not, actually. <laughs> Catechisms <laughs> don't have the, the charism of infallibility, even if they're promulgated by a pope. Um, obviously, there's a certain high degree of assumption of accuracy that's involved 
with papal teaching and with catechisms that are approved by popes and councils, but they are not actually infallible. So when do you actually want to question what's in the catechism? I would say a first clue would be when it's contradicting the other catechisms of the church. Same for popes. When do you want to question what the pope might be saying? What if when he directly contradicts his predecessor and many of his predecessors? And when do you want to conclude certainly that um, they can't be right or can't be interpreted in a certain way when it contradicts the infallible teaching of the Catholic Church? Maybe just to demonstrate that there is a clear contradiction between catechisms, let's just pull up the Roman Catechism. Um, let me read. This is from the Roman Catechism um, published by the Order of the Council of Trent and approved by every pope since then. It says, another kind of lawful slaying, and I think this is following up on self-defense, another kind of lawful slaying belongs to the civil authorities to whom is entrusted power of life and death by the legal and judicious exercise of which they punish the guilty and protect the innocent. The use of this power far from involving the crime of murder is an act of paramount, paramount obedience to this commandment, commandment, which prohibits murder. The end of the command is the preservation and security of human life. Now the punishments inflicted by the civil authority, which is the legitimate avenger of crime naturally tend to this end since they give security to life by repressing outrage and violence. Hence these words of David in the morning, I put to death all the wicked of the land that I might cut off the workers of iniquity from the city of the Lord. Now contrast that with the Pope Francis update to the catechism. And you can clearly see by the light of reason that one of these is not correct. One of these is an error, absolutely. And technically, neither of these catechisms has more authority than the other. They're both catechisms that are approved of by popes. So if you want to find out which one's correct, you actually have to look at the more authoritative teaching of the church on the matter. Now, as for John Paul II's version, I think it stops short of contradicting the Catechism of Trent. But it kind of does a slippery thing where it says, yes, the church has always allowed recourse to the death penalty. And the, I'll read the sentence that I find kind of tricky here in my 1992 catechism. It says, um, the traditional teaching of the church does not exclude recourse to the death penalty if this is the only possible way of effectively defending human lives against the unjust aggressor. So that's not necessarily false, but traditionally Catholic teaching never said it has to be the only possible way of defending human lives from the aggressor. There are other factors that come in to applying the death penalty. And it isn't just that the church never excluded the death penalty. It positively promoted it as praiseworthy and fitting as the correct punishment for crimes of a certain gravity. And even in this same catechism, the very paragraph before, it says, legitimate public authority has the right and duty to inflict punishment proportionate to the gravity of the offense. Now let's think back to the crime of Orlando Hall is sitting him in jail and paying for him to have a comfortable life in jail proportionate to the gravity of his crime of burying a young girl alive after raping her. I don't think so. Yeah. And uh, Pope Pius the 12th in the 1950s spoke on this as well. He said that it's possible to err in punishment, both by being too brutal and too lenient. And he specifically said that, crimes that like Orlando Hall's basically treat human life as having no value and um, stuff like premeditated murder and stuff like that. In regard to these crimes, he says that um, 
a mere to punish them with a mere privation of civil rights would be an insult to justice. This is yeah. the kind of thing we have to grapple with on the topic of capital punishment, which I think is completely and utterly ignored by the arguments put forward by John Paul II. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, coming back to what you were saying. So um, another fantastic article and resource with regards to this is Edward Fesser. He's, he's done a great number of articles and works. He even has a book out on this very topic. Um, so, but he says in one of his articles, which again, you can find at theology of the buddy.com. He says, uh, it was clearly and consistently taught by the popes up to and including Benedict the 16th, this regard to, um, uh, the death penalty that Christians can in principle legitimately resort to the death penalty is taught by the Roman catechism promulgated by Pope St. Pius V, the Catechism of Christian Doctrine, promulgated by Pope St. Pius X, and the 92 and 97 versions of the most recent Catechism, promulgated by Pope St. John Paul II. This lasts despite the fact that John Paul was famously opposed to applying capital punishment in practice. Pope St. Innocent I and Pope Innocent III taught that acceptance of the legitimacy in principle of capital punishment is a requirement of Catholic orthodoxy. Pope Pius XII explicitly endorsed the death penalty on several occasions, and this is why Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, as John Paul II's chief doctrinal officer, explicitly affirmed in a 2004 memorandum, quote, and Again, this is directed really at anybody who would come at us and say, oh, you can't disagree with the Holy Father on these points. Joseph Ratzinger at this point in 2004 stated, quote, if a Catholic were to be at odds with the Holy Father on the application of capital punishment, he would not for that reason be considered unworthy to present himself to receive Holy Communion, while the Church exhorts civil authorities to exercise discretion and mercy in imposing punishment on criminals, it may still be permissible to have recourse to capital punishment, end quote. So, I mean, it's, there has been defense here all the way around, and then suddenly there's this quick left turn <laughs> out of nowhere on the death penalty, right? It's yeah, it's startling. Now, one of the most important things that Phaser points out, and sorry, I think we're pronouncing it totally differently. I think it's Phaser, but you say Fesser, and I don't know. Okay. Uh, maybe... I'm wrong. I'm but stunned. I think it sounds way cooler to say phasers. Set your phaser to stun. Yeah. Or in the case of uh, a grave <laughs> crime, set them to kill. If you are the uh, legitimate public authority. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so one of the most important things he, he talks about is um, the ordinary magisterium and the um, agreement of the fathers. So, and this is something that Father um, Dave Nix talks about too. Um, when we talk about the death penalty, he found it important to go back and look at the levels of infallibility and the levels of authority in um, in the church. Was and, that what, wait? Was that Father Dave Nix or was that? Um... Timothy Flanders. Because Timothy Flanders he did that. I've done it too, but I was reading Father Dave Nix today about oh, it. Nice. So yeah, because I'm yeah. sure multiple people have said the same thing. But he was discussing the levels in ought, right? But basically, the highest authority for our faith is the Holy Scriptures, right? And the interpretation of both sacred scripture and sacred tradition falls primarily on the magisterium and the church fathers, right? So two areas where teachings generally become infallible other than the uh, explicit definitions of ec ecumenical councils and ex cathedra statements of popes are ordinary magisterium when it's taught throughout the entire history of the church consistently and 
when the early church fathers are in agreement on the meaning of scripture. So we know scripture is, um, what's the technical term? It's not infallible, but it's inerrant. inerrant. Yeah. Um, and no one is to um, interpret scripture in any sense that opposes what the fathers have interpreted it as, right? The way I think of it is basically like the fathers of the church had the true Catholic faith. If the faith that we have is not the same faith that they have, if we interpret the scriptures to mean something opposite from them, we don't hold the Catholic faith. They do. So the church has always held that if in unanimous agreement in their interpretation of scripture, then it's infallible. And that applies to the death penalty, both in the old Testament and in St. Paul. And it applies to the ordinary magisterium as well. Like Pope Francis is the first Pope to oppose the death penalty. Like, and like the, completely and say it's a vi a gray violation of human dignity. Yeah. Yeah. So Adam in his video accuses Catholics who are in support of the death penalty as being hypocrites who do not have a whole life ethic. Um, but, you know, in response to that, I think that, um, and Edward Fazer would, <laughs> would state to him that even St. Robert Bellarmine would accuse Adam of being heretical for this viewpoint. Um, that Christians can apply capital punishment justifiably and to maintain otherwise as a heretical position. And if, again, if you look at the teaching of Holy Mother Church over two millennia, if you look at the testament of sacred scripture, you see that our Lord has clearly <laughs> stated that capital punishment can be used. He himself has, uh, you know, the, the Lord himself has inflicted capital punishment on uh, large numbers of people um, and, and on individuals and has called for people in the scriptures to do it themselves. And, you know, so again, can, can God himself commit an immoral, an immoral act, something that is not in line with human dignity? Can God himself do that? I would submit no. And to hold a position of that is a heretical statement. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road, right? If you're committed to the position that if someone says the death penalty is licit, then they're not pro-life and they're not a faithful Catholic. Think about who you're accusing. Broaden your horizon beyond the 1990s. You're saying that Thomas Aquinas is not pro-life and not a Catholic. You're saying that Bellarmine and every other doctor of the church are not pro-life. You're saying Therese of Lisieux, the little flower who had such love for that man condemned to death, still not pro-life. You're saying that all the fathers of the church are not pro-life. How can, how can you say that if you think about what that means beyond the one tiny moment of time in which we currently find ourselves? Mm -hmm. Truth is not just here and now. It's If it's true, it's been true for the entire history of the church. And the church has been teaching people that this mortal sin of murder in capital punishment is okay. Popes have been ordering people put to death throughout the entire history of the church. Popes have been ruling the papal state for papal states for over a thousand years and committing capital punishment. And, you know, cap Catholic rulers who are saints have <laughs> made laws allowing capital punishment and approved of them. It, the list goes on and on. Right. We're not. And that's the thing. Like it's not, in the eyes of the church, inflicting capital punishment 
the state having that authority to do that, it's not a mortal sin. It's not the mortal sin of murder, you know? Mm -hmm. So it is murder, murder, what Orlando Hall did, that is, that is an affront to human dignity, but, but capital punishment when justly applied is, is certainly not an affront to human dignity at all, at all. Yeah. I think this is a good point that was brought up by a priest in a a sermon about this very topic was like to apply capital punishment to a murderer such as Orlando Hall actually shows how much we value human life. Like if you think that Orlando Hall should doesn't deserve death for that crime, how much do you value the life of his victim? If her life was actually worth as much as, you know, we know that it is that she was a beloved child of God, then consider the gravity of the crime inflicted against her and consider that the the secular power has a duty to inflict a punishment that's proportionate to that crime. If you think that the punishment proportionate to that is just to have some of his civil civil liberties taken away, then I would submit that you don't truly value the life of that victim. At least that's how it appears. Mm-hmm. And traditionally, um, we'll we'll link to this fantastic talk from uh, Census Fidelium in the show notes. You know, traditionally, when the church was inflicting capital punishment in the papal states, it was pointing to the fact that there are greater things worse than death. And you are being given an opportunity in the here and now to convert, to make penance. And even in the experience of capital punishment to make penance for the crime. And so to enter into eternal life, you know, like it's not, it has never been the case that the church is just looking at this life and saying, this is all that there is, you know, we're here, what, 70, 80, 90 years in compared to the breadth of eternity, you know, and what we do here matters. What we do will impact our eternity. And so the church has really looked at the, the inflicting of capital punishment as a mercy um, for the sinner because it essentially gives them the opportunity to convert here and now. Yeah, at the very least, the church, when inflicting capital punishment, has always done her best to care for the souls of the people being executed, right? You can find a lot of details, especially about how, you know, this sermon goes into a lot of it of how execution was done in the papal states. You know, they had an order of of priests who would basically stay up all night with the person about to be executed the night before rolling them and urging them to repent and they would be walked to the guillotine by a procession with the crucifix and incense and altar boys. They would put the crucifix before the person's face as they were to be executed. So, you know, they have every chance of repenting. And this is exactly what happened with the, um, the murder that St. Therese prayed for. I would encourage everyone to look at that story. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, (laughs) She just, you know, cared so much for the soul of this, this person who was condemned justly to death and prayed for him incessantly. And he, at the very last moment before being killed, began to weep and asked for the crucifix, right? And asked to kiss the feet of, Christ on the crucifix, you know, this is, 
this is how the church has looked at it, not as, you know, the secular world looks at it, right? Um, in more, in times when Catholicism was um, ascendant and basically the um, dominant religion in the land, capital punishment was common and it was seen this way. It's only in modern secular times that capital punishment is used less and less. And it has a lot to do with the atheist view that death is the end. There is nothing to hope for beyond death. And it also kind of ties into the Americanism accusation, right? Like I would say the reason why Europe and Canada a lot of Europe anyway, is abolishing the death penalty. And the United States is seen as a laggard in this respect for not abolishing it yet. It's because the United States is still more Christian than Canada and most of Europe. Hell yeah. It's the, <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, it's so true. 100%. Man. It's the atheist mentality that wants to abolish the death penalty. It doesn't believe in the necessity of justice. And it doesn't believe in hope after death. And it, and it doesn't even have a a proper understanding of justice. You know, when reading that article or that, um, uh, that quote from John Paul II with regards to the penal system, you know, although I, I can understand the, you know, uh, over certain cases questioning whether it can be justly applied or not. Um, I think that's necessary. I think we need to have those discussions. Um, but you know, him saying that the penal system, you know, has done away with the need of capital punishment because it, it is a solid system. It, it really isn't. It really isn't. I mean, Mike and I were talking about this last night that, you know, if you're in jail and you've got the right connections, you, you're living in the lap of luxury if you know you can get whatever you want you know if, if you've got connections and money for sure you know and the other thing i would say is there are a lot of murders and violent crimes in prison mm-hmm. there are a lot of sexual assaults in in prison you are not rendering a person 100% safe by putting them in prison in the no. united states of america or in canada or in canada or Just- yeah, just recently in the Elgin Middlesex Detention Center, a dude was declared dead. They didn't go into the details. They're not, they're not talking about the details of what happened. Um, but there's, there's an attorney, um, that has been prosecuting crimes that have been happening in these detention centers. And he's saying that it happens all the time, you know, yeah. like, And this is what our atheist society wants us to think that Orlando Hall is 100% safe to put in a jail. And if he says he's a woman, you can put him in a woman's jail, even though he's a rapist. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's true, too. It's not a joke. That's actually (laughs) what it's coming. There are people who very seriously support this and very powerful support this. It's on the verge of being the law. It almost is in Canada. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, I mean, the penal system is broken. It doesn't actually inflict just punishment on the aggressor. It doesn't do, it doesn't give justice to the families and, you know, to, those who are the victims, it doesn't, it doesn't do any of that. Um, and yeah, I I mean, I won't, I won't get into grave details. Um, but I mean, my dad for a number of years worked, worked in a number of jails across Ontario. And I mean, I remember hearing stories as a kid and I was like, like, these are bad people you know, but they're getting away with, they're getting away with murder. (laughs) You know, (laughs) they literally are. And yeah. So, but I mean, that's really tangential, but the, but the point is that 
capital punishment is something that the church has always held as as being licit and and St. Thomas the Coin St. Thomas Aquinas talks about that as well maybe we can kind of use him as kind of the the last book the end of the eight. conversation <laughs> sure yeah so Thomas Aquinas he uh pretty directly talks about capital punishment in his article on murder specifically he talks about in two different articles under that um, question, whether it is lawful to kill the innocent and whether it's lawful to kill sinners. And he does say that the public authority has the ability to kill sinners according to the law. Um, I think the probably the most relevant part to read is the third objection to his position which is basically um, talking about how we owe charity to all men and that it's uncharitable to kill people, essentially. Uh, I'll read it, just so I'm not explaining it badly. So the third objection, further, it is not lawful for any good end whatsoever to do that which is evil in itself, according to Augustine and the philosopher. Now to kill a man is evil in itself, since we are bound to have charity towards all men. And we wish our friends to live and to exist according to ethics. Therefore, it is no wise lawful to kill a man who has sinned. Now, Aquinas is upholding the position that the public authorities have the um, ability to morally kill. His reply to objection three is that by sinning, man departs from the order of reason and consequently falls away from the dignity of his manhood insofar as he is naturally free and exists for himself and he falls into the slavish state of the beasts by being disposed of according as he is useful to others this is expressed in psalm 48 man when he was in honor did not understand he hath been compared to senseless beasts and made like to them and in Proverbs 11.29, the fool shall serve the wise. Hence, although it be evil in itself to kill a man so long as he preserve his dignity, yet it may be good to kill a man who has sinned, even as to kill a beast. For a bad man is worse than a beast and is more harmful, as the philosopher states. That's kind of like uh, another point that's kind of gone from I think both JP2 and Francis and their considerations is how reasonably we line up um, objective human dignity with the ability of the public authority to um, commit capital punishment. Um, Pius XII put it in a different way. He basically said that um, the public authority um, removes the good of life from a man who has already um, deprived himself of his right to life by his crime. This is basically stating a different way what Thomas Aquinas said. Yeah. So um, the reason I kind of bring this up is because um, if you look at the reasoning of, you know, we can kill people only if it's in the last defense of society, there's a missing piece here, right? Because as this objection to Aquinas correctly points out, you cannot do um, evil directly, even if it's for a good end of defending society. So why is it then, I would ask someone who holds the JP2 position, why is it that you can kill someone who's guilty of a crime if it's absolutely necessary to defend society, but you can't kill an innocent person? even if it's in the last defense of society. What is the difference between the innocent and the guilty? And this is also a point that Pope Francis explicitly denied. I don't know if you caught that, Chris, but in some of Pope Francis's statements, he's saying there's been a growing awareness that human dignity is maintained even after committing serious crimes. He's said that a number of times. So I think... Although some of his remarks seem superficial, there's enough enough depth that he's actually, at least implicitly, trying to refute Pius XII and Aquinas on this. 
he's actually trying to say that when a person commits a serious sin, they don't lose their right to life. And that's kind of the sticking point, right? The thing that as traditional Catholics, we recognize too, is that mortal sin doesn't just separate you from God. It It's the death of charity in the soul. And literally, this if you're baptized, this the Holy Spirit's indwelling departs in that moment. You know, yeah, you are held in existence because of, of, of God's grace, but mortal sin dehumanizes a soul and, you know, it, it doesn't just darken the intellect. I mean, but it, 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 it really does turn you into a beast as, as uh, Aquinas would say. Yeah. Another point related to this that the priest on census fidelium brings up is like God placed the entirety of the human race under the death sentence in the garden of Eden, right? We are all like essentially born under a death sentence. We are going to die and God has ordained it. So because of sin. And so like, it doesn't fit with the optimistic um, universalist mindset of everyone's okay. And, you know, um, let's all be friends and human fraternity, etc. But no, sin is very serious. And this is a perspective that's completely lacking in um, a perspective like what Pope Francis is advocating, right? That, you know, I, I think it's all linked in with stuff like the, uh, the issues with, um, divorce and remarriage and stuff like that, where in some of his encyclicals, he's implied stuff like it might be impossible to follow God's commandments and stuff like that. There's a very deformed view of what sin is in this uh, theology. I think that's why this error comes out with regard to capital punishment as well. Right. Yeah. And we, and we can't, we cannot in, in good faith, say that this is a development of doctrine. It's not. And there's really, you know. if it's a break from doctrine, it's not a development. Um, Edward Fazer says, you know, slapping the label development onto a contradiction doesn't transform it into a non contradiction, you know, and I, that's mm. so true. And, and whether it be divorce and remarriage or the death penalty or whatever it be, whatever hot button issue in the culture that, you know, we want to try to jive with. I mean, you can't just change what the church church teaches and, and call it a development of Christian doctrine. It doesn't exist. You know, someone like Cardinal Newman, John Henry Newman in his, in his development of Christian doctrine would make that point very clear that, you know, a break from, from the historical teaching of the church is not a development. Yeah. A legitimate development never contradicts or overrides the previous tradition. It's always the same doctrine, the same sense. You can't twist words and make the doctrine mean something else. It's always the same, same teaching and in the same sense that it was meant when it was written. Yeah. And the church has, has even said, I can't remember where, but it's basically as anathematized people who hold that position that, you know, that the church's teaching can be changed. It, it can't be. So, yeah. So how do we, how do we want to end this? I've got one more Aquinas quote that I wanted to sneak in. I'm trying to think about how okay. <laughs> it's the one from Summa Contra Gentiles. It's something else that I know we're going long, but another, no, let's, let's do it. Thing, another thing I wanted to point out was um, the issue of when you're considering defending society, only considering physical safety and not considering the uh, scandalous moral influence of sinners on society. Um, and this is something that comes out in this quote too. Um, also hits on the idea of 
depriving people of the opportunity to repent, which is often a criticism you hear. Okay, so here's Aquinas. Uh, the fact that the evil ones, as long as they live, can be corrected from their errors does not prohibit that they may be justly executed. For the danger which threatens from their way of life is greater and more certain than the good which may be expected from their improvement. <laughs> That's huge. <laughs> Say say that again. Danger, say that the again. The danger that threatens from their way of life is greater and more certain than the good which may be expected from their improvement. Basically, the moral and spiritual influence of a grave sinner on the community is outweighs the, if it's a grave situation, it can outweigh the good of that person's possible repentance. Wow. Yeah. This, he goes on to say after that, they also have at that criti critical point of death, the opportunity to be converted to God through repentance. And if they are so obstinate that even at the point of death, their heart does not draw back from malice. It is possible to make a quite probable judgment that they would never come away from evil. That's, I mean, it's so true. The, yeah. That's, yeah i forget yeah. who said this but it's what was it nothing clears the head like a uh an execution date yeah <laughs> the priest in on census fidelium's talks is one of the uh best spiritual benefits you could have is to know the day and hour of your own death yeah it definitely I, gives people a golden opportunity to repent yeah you know looking at this conversation, right? Looking at society itself, especially in, in our modern age and in, in the church, I, I am firmly convinced, and I've talked about this ad nauseum, that, that we're dealing in an orphan age, that we're dealing with on a global scale, the lack of fatherhood. And so with that comes the lack of discipline, the lack of realizing the uh, weight of our errors and being called to better things. So, you know, the apostolic penitentiary, for example, in the church doesn't exist, you know, like it, she, she doesn't exist in the same way that she used to. You know, those who are, you know, spouting the greatest errors and committing the greatest sins aren't being really punished in the church. Those who are doing good things, like traditional orders and things like that, they're being squashed and attacked and vilified. And so in an age when fathers in the secular world are letting their children run amok and saying, you know what? You do you. In the in the church, we're kind of doing the same thing. We're saying, there's no penalty for your crimes. You know, God loves you. And, you know, live your life. I don't know. I, I just see it as all systemic. I see this like we're all acting as if, like our fathers are acting like they're not fathers. They're not teaching and disciplining in the secular arm and in the ecclesial arm. And so, you know, when it comes to these big sins like murder and all of that, that need a just punishment, we're like, eh, you know, but, but we need the strong arm of, of the father to, to really to discipline us. And, you know, in the times when the church was, you know, healthy, and was actually inflicting punishments for for grave sins. Society was healthier, you know. Christendom existed; it existed. Now it's crumbling at the hands of Christians who are afraid to uh, are afraid to speak and 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 do the right thing. So, I don't know. That's just yeah. kind of my thought. Like Adam said, we're not going to win anybody to our side when we're so hypocritical. I agree. <laughs> yes, Adam. <laughs> compromise. When the church taught the truth without compromise, she saw conversion and prosperity. And currently our shepherds 
fail to teach her true teachings on a number of subjects, the death penalty being only one of them. And we do not see good fruit from that. So I agree. I also agree with his, his offhand statement that we need to be ballsy and stand up for the truth. You know what? It's not ballsy to be against capital punishment. It's super popular. The church in her true teaching is supports capital punishment. And so here we are agreeing with you and taking up your call to be ballsy. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. So, you know, um, I don't know. Was that too, uh, was it too ballsy? Mike too ballsy <laughs> sons of thunder, not sons of blunder. Um, so take this, take this for what it is. Spend some time with it, but remember again, coming back to the, the thing that we were talking about at the beginning, uh, right. We're in the time of Advent and Advent is a time for us to reflect on those four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And all of these things are incredibly important. And like Mike said, we've all received the death penalty. Um, we don't know when that, when that execution date's coming, when our soul and body will be separated. But thanks be to God that death doesn't have the last word anymore, right? Christ in his incarnation has made it possible for death to be overcome, for the resurrection of the dead, the reuniting of our souls and bodies at the last judgment. And, um, what hope that gives us and should give us and like, thank God for Advent that we can really build our anticipation and look forward to that, that great moment when Christ comes again in glory and raises the dead from their graves and the saints and the, and, and the angels rejoice and the, and the rest. <laughs> go to hell in soul and body for all eternity. Greater than one person, actually greater than half of all people deal with it. Our Lord said it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's another podcast. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's the next podcast. Who knows? Um, but yeah, so we're, we're going to continue in this spirit of Advent of looking at the four last things. Um, so next, next week, I'm not sure which one we're getting into, but yeah, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be great. Just great. Well, again, thanks everybody for listening to today's podcast. We really appreciate it. We have a giveaway coming up very soon. So if you're not following us on social media, get on it. We're going to be sharing it on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, probably, um, but primarily on Facebook and Instagram. And yeah, so you're going to want to stay subscribed uh, to find out about that. Among, among the giveaways uh, will be, maybe we can give them a little hint. What, how, how can we how can we hint this for our friends, our buddies? I don't know. Giving any kind of hint might be whiskey business. Oh, I like it. Okay. So stay tuned to that. Again, follow us at Theology of the Buddy, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, if you're not yet subscribed, you're going to need to be in order to be part of this uh, giveaway. So make sure you're subscribed wherever you listen. And new episodes are released every Wednesday. So until then, stay, stay tready. tready. <laughs>